Grab your calculators because we're going to math it up today with linkage mapping. Hey, this is Mikey from AVO Prep Academy, and you're joining us here today in a continuation of our discussion on gene linkage. But in today's video, we're going to do something called linkage mapping. Linkage mapping is a technique that leverages mathematics in our ability to determine distances between multiple loci within a single chromosome. And in order to apply this neat little trick, we're going to be using Drosophila as an example, specifically looking at two traits that we know to be linked. This would be the body color gene, as well as the wing shape gene. In Drosophila, or fruit flies, the wild type color for the body should be gray. There is a mutation that causes the body to be black. On the other hand, the wings ought to be normal, but there is again a mutation that makes the wing all shriveled up that we call the vestigial wing. Now, Thomas Morgan had already discovered that these two genes were linked on the same chromosome. But what we'll do in this video is to just use those genes as an example to figure out exactly how we do this linkage mapping process. And just as a disclaimer, the linkage distance that we're going to calculate at the end of this video is not the actual distance between these two genes because I wanted to use simpler numbers to demonstrate this point. In our example today, I'm just going to be referring to the body color gene as the A gene and the wing shape gene as the B gene. In order to demonstrate linkage mapping, I will be doing a test cross. This test cross will be between a double heterozygous individual who appears to have a gray body and normal wings against the double mutant, which would have black body with vestigial wings. Just as we demonstrated in our previous video, this type of cross would yield a four by one Punnett square. And what's brilliant about about this particular type of test cross is that you would be able to genotype a fruit fly by simply looking at it. For example, at the top, we have big A, little a, big B, little b. This fruit fly would have a gray body and normal wings. Next, we have a fruit fly who would be heterozygous for the body color, but homozygous recessive for the wing. So that fruit fly would be gray, but with vestigial wings. And then we would have black body with normal wings and black body with vestigial wings. So by simply looking at the fruit fly, you'd be able to make the counts without having to run any fancy molecular genetics in order to determine their genotype. Now, supposing that we were able to rear 1,000 baby fruit flies. What we would expect to see under independent assortment is that each of these phenotypes should be represented at about 25%, so 250 baby fruit flies for each of the phenotypes. However, if the genes are linked, then we know that that's not going to happen, and perhaps what we observe is what we see on the following table. Here we see that phenotypes gray body and normal wings are way overrepresented at 398, black body and vestigial wings at the bottom overrepresented yet again at 402. The offspring that would have resulted from recombination of genes A and B are heavily underrepresented here at 104 and 96. Now keep in mind that we would expect to see one to one to one to one ratio if these genes were to be independently assorting and we had a complete randomness with which all of these gametes were formed in the dihybrid individual. But we don't have that, which leads us to believe that perhaps this is in fact a linked gene. Now in tables like this, we're actually able to use some terminologies to categorize the offspring into what we call parental types and recombinant combinant types. The parental types are the ones that are overrepresented as a result of the fact that the parental combination of alleles did not reshuffle or recombine during the meiotic process. The recombinants are those few that did recombine and then ended up eventually in the offspring's genotype. Now, so far, we haven't seen anything new. This is exactly the type of results that we talked about in the previous video. But what we can do from this point onwards is where things get really interesting. Firstly, what we can do is to calculate something called the recombination frequency. Recombination frequency is a very, very easy thing to do. All you have to do is count up all of the recombinants and divide that number by the total number of offspring. And in this case, we'll be adding 104 and 96, which would give me 200. And of course, there will be a thousand offspring in total, leading to 200 divided by 1000 or 0.20. Now, I want to pause here for a second and consider what this really means. A recombination of 0.2 means that there was about 20% of the individuals who were born, which resulted from the recombination, which occurred during prophase one of meiosis one. But I want you to think about what the maximum recombination frequency would be if these genes were really far apart, leading to a random number of crossovers, or if they were simply on two separate chromosomes. The answer is that that recombination frequency would be 0.5. 0.5 would give you the maximum number of recombinants because of the fact that recombinants versus parentals would equal each other at 0.5 and 0.5, adding up to that one. Another inference that we can draw from this, which I think is even more important, is that that recombination frequency would get closer and closer and closer to 0.5 the farther the genes were from each other on that single chromosome. And the closer the two loci are, the lower the recombination frequency 
frequency would be. That sort of makes sense. If they're really, really, really close, then that would mean that the number of crossover events happening between those two targets would be decreasing. And with fewer crossover events, you would expect to see fewer recombinant offspring in the total count. So putting this together, it almost seems like recombination frequency has a direct relationship to the distance between the two genes. The farther the genes are, the higher the recombination frequency, the closer that they are, the lower the recombination frequency. This is what Morgan's lab recognized. And what he said was that you can consider recombination frequencies as something called map units, because map units, a distance unit between two genes, well, it was directly related to the recombination frequency. And in our example, now we can draw that chromosome, place those genes A and B, and maybe we can write this 20 map units between loci A and loci B, where those two genes reside. Now, while this was a very simple example, there are two complications that could arise. One is that when we study fruit flies, we don't simply write A's and B's for genes. Instead, we use symbols like B plus for wild type for body color being gray and B for the mutant type and VG plus for the wild type normal wings and VG for the vestigial wings. It makes things a little bit trickier because it deviates from what you're used to in Mendelian genetics, but it's really no different than using A's and B's. And the second complication arises when we're trying to map out multiple genes. Now for AP biology, you're most likely not going to have to do that. But what's important to note is that when you are mapping multiple genes, you can also do some cool things. For instance, let's say that you've determined that the distance between genes A and B is 20 map units, and perhaps B and C is 10 map units. Now, you really don't know whether it goes ACB or ABC, but one of the things that you can do is to calculate the distance between A and C. If the distance between A and C is also 10 map units, then you know that it goes ACB. But if the distance between A and C is 30 map units, then you know it goes ABC. So it is entirely possible to order the genes along the chromosome using simply linkage mapping, which ultimately could be done by breeding fruit flies in a lab. Now, there is one thing that we didn't cover in this video, and that is testing to see whether the genes were actually linked or not. But in the example that we gave, it was pretty obvious that these genes were linked. But if it was a little bit iffy, what would you do? And the answer to that is chi-squared analysis, which is coming up in the video card right after this video. This has been Mikey with AVO Prep Academy. We'll see you in the chi-squared video.